It was the 21st of July, 1403. And whilst it had been a baking hot summer's day, there was no sign of thunderclouds. However, there was a tension in the air. To the west, the sun was just starting to dip toward the Welsh mountains. And here, on a slightly inclined field outside Shrewsbury in Shropshire, England, two armies faced each other. 25,000 sons of England about to fight each other in the butcher's yard of a medieval battle, a rustle and a murmur, as the horseman rides back up the hill. Had the rebels agreed to terms? Eyes turned towards the king, mounted under his royal banner. He raised his hand high. Commands were shouted down the line. This was it then. Nearby, someone's puking up their guts and looking up at your fellow countrymen on the ridge. Are they feeling the same as you? Big breath and God willing, we'll survive this afternoon and see tomorrow morning. That golden sun from the mountains of Wales shone in the sky. And then suddenly, it almost went dark as thousands upon thousands of arrows arced through the sky. The Battle of Shrewsbury, 1403, is pretty much forgotten in history. I mean, it's not wasn't part of a civil war or an international war. It was, in many respects, it was a bit of a one-off. But it did have some important repercussions. It pitted the forces of Harry Hotspur Percy against those of King Henry IV of England and his son, also called Henry, later on the victor at Agincourt. It was the first time that two armies of longbow archers had fought each other on English soil. And the carnage that those archers inflicted in the next two short hours was a lesson that the English remembered when facing the French at Agincourt a decade later. As ever, you know, battles don't just materialise out of thin air. The, the why a battle was fought is, for me, just as important as what happened. So. Let's go back four years to 1399. Because it was in this year that Richard II, grandson of Edward III, was deposed by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. Hen uh, Richard was then imprisoned in uh, Pontefract Castle in Yorkshire and was starved to death. And Bolingbroke became King Henry IV. And he was aided in this coup by the powerful Percy family, the Earls of Northumberland, probably the, the Lords of the North. However, during the intervening four years, relations between the Percys and Bolingbroke had soured. Firstly, the Percys claimed that Henry owed them £20,000 for their efforts in both securing his throne and defending the North against the Scots. £20,000 was a colossal sum in those days' money. And even if Henry had wanted to pay them, he didn't actually have the means to do so right there and then. Secondly, the Percys had expected to gain lands in Cumbria upon Henry's assumption of the throne, but instead those lands were given to the rival Neville family. Next up, in that recent war with the Scots that I was just talking about, King Henry had instructed that all Scottish prisoners were to be held captive as hostages to basically ensure peace on the border, rather than being ransomed uh, back to their families or to their king as the Percys were really keen to do. And I guess you would be keen to ransom as many prisoners back as well if the king owed you 20 grand, wouldn't you? And then there was the issue of Sir Edmund Mortimer. Now, those of you who followed my talks might remember him from my video uh, this week in British history on the 21st of June. The Welsh had risen in rebellion under Owain Glyndwr. And Sir Edmund Mortimer had marched an English army into Wales to deal with him. However, at the Battle of Bringlass uh, a year earlier, 1402, Glyndwr had achieved a stunning victory over the English and had actually captured Sir Edmund in the process. And he offered to ransom this English nobleman back to King Henry. But Henry refused. Now, <laughs> this wasn't a moral stance about, I don't know, not dealing with terrorists or rebels nor was it being consistent with his no-ransom policy for his own Scottish prisoners. 
It didn't even have to do with whether Henry had the cash. But it did have a lot to do with who Sir Edmund was. Because Sir Edmund and his older brother, Roger Mortimer, Earl of March, were great-grandsons of King Edward III. In fact, their grandfather was Edward's second son, whereas Henry IV was descended from Edward's third son. You see where this is going? <laughs> Remember that Henry IV had usurped, as Henry Bolingbroke had usurped the throne. He had ousted Richard II, who, by the way, had inherited the throne because his dad was Edward's eldest son. So if we look at the line of succession, it was the Mortimers rather than Bolingbroke who should be on the throne if Richard was no longer there. In fact, Sir Edmund's older brother, Roger Mortimer, the Earl of March, had been Richard II's heir presumptive. In other words, the heir until Richard had any children, which he didn't. So here's a lesson to you all. This is what happens when you usurp power. There's always someone with an equal, if not more valid claim, knocking around. So, you know, if one of the two Mortimer brothers was now incarcerated in the back end of Wales by some hairy Welsh rebel, well, so much the better as far as Henry was concerned. Who cares? Well, probably his brother, Roger, M Roger Mortimer, Earl of March, might have cared. And also his sister, Elizabeth, who just happened to be married to Harry Hotspur Percy, scion of the Percy family of Northumberland. Oh, and Sir Edmund Mortimer probably wasn't too chuffed either. In fact, he absolutely repudiated his allegiance to the king. He married Glendur's daughter, and then he joined his new father, a father-in-law, in Owen's rebellion. In early 1403, the Percys had had enough and issued a manifesto against Henry IV, outlining their material grievances against the king, but more importantly, uh, accusing him of usurping the throne which is true, and the Percy should know they helped him do it. They managed to wriggle out of that point and said that they'd supported Henry um, be, uh, to, to get his confiscated lands back from Richard. And they didn't realise that he would then take the king captive, captive and then starve him to death and then also take the throne. Hmm. Interesting. They then accused Henry of killing Richard by starving him to death, which in fairness, yeah, bang on the money again. Although they did neglect to point out that actually it was the Percys who had handed Richard over to Henry for his safekeeping. Oh, and they also said that Henry had not allowed free elections to Parliament. So hooray for the Percys, striking a blow for English justice and democracy. And there was me thinking they were motivated purely by land and money. Oh, and just for good measure, they now announced that Roger Mortimer was the rightful king. Should Henry be worried that the most powerful family in the north of England was now openly against him? Well, if he wasn't, he soon was when he heard that the Percys had formed an alliance with Owen Glyndua and his son-in-law and their own relative, Sir Edmund Mortimer. The young Harry Hotspur Percy, already an experienced warrior, having fought in the recent Scottish War and even more recently fighting the Welsh rebels, yeah, that's the same rebels he was now allied to, uh, gathered a small band of about 200 retainers and set out with his uncle Thomas, the Earl of Worcester, to march south uh, from the northeast of England to join Glendua. Uh, his father, the Earl of Northumberland, would follow later on. Now, whilst Glendua was, was party to this overall idea of a united rebellion, the sudden march by Hotspur caught him slightly unawares as he was actually down in the far southwest of Wales in Carmarthenshire, fighting government forces. On the 9th of July, Hotspur arrived in the city of Chester. Now, the county of Cheshire had been ultra-loyal to Richard II, and so he had no problem recruiting experienced longbow archers to join his army against Henry Bolingbroke. And from Chester, he now advanced on Shrewsbury, which was actually being held by Henry IV's son, Henry, Prince of Wales. We now know him as Henry V, the victor at Agincourt. The king, meanwhile, rushed his army to Shrewsbury to prevent the Percys uniting with Glyndua coming from Wales. And he arrived on the 20th of July, just hours before the Percys did. 
Hotspur set up his camp near the village of Berwick, just north of the River Severn, and waited for Glyndoa and his Welsh. Where the hell were they? Henry decided to act fast before Glyndoa could arrive. The following morning, the 21st of July, his army moved out of Shrewsbury. They crossed the river to the east at Uffington in a hope of coming round and cutting off Percy's line of retreat to Chester. The Percys realised there was going to be a battle and the Welsh weren't going to be there to help them. Nevertheless, they had a sizeable uh, army. They probably had about 10,000 men, men and the king had a larger force, 14,000. But, you know, the experienced Cheshire archers might just keep those royal forces at bay. So the Percys moved slightly north from Berwick, ruining the, the royalist attempt to, to encircle them. And they're on a rise in the fields, looking back towards Shrewsbury and the River Severn and the Shropshire Hills beyond. They turned and waited for the king. It was the afternoon of the 21st of July, 1403. The vigil of Mary Magdalene. Harry and Thomas Percy lined their men up on a ridge just, just north of where the current Battle Church now stands. And the Royalists lined up to face them almost in line alongside the Battle Church, as I say, as it is now. Uh, Henry IV, as was the custom of the day, commanded the centre. His son, Henry, Prince of Wales, was on the left, and the Earl of Stafford commanded the right. Attempts to parley broke down, and two hours before dusk, King Henry IV raised his hand in a signal for his archers to fire. Then his vanguard, led by the Earl of Stafford on the right, advanced up the hill towards the rebel lines. Now, I don't know about you, but there's, there's a tendency to think that battles are sort of field, fought, fought on fields covered in sort of manicured grass. But that's, that's never the case. I mean, battles in these days were fought on heathlands, or in this case, across uh, agricultural fields, often sown with crops. And this was the case here with Stafford's men. The field they were advancing up was thick with a crop of peas. Uh, which the, the rebels had actually tied together to hamper that advance of men and horses alike. Up on the rebel line, the Cheshire archers, in their padded green and white jackets stuffed with wool, watched and waited as the evening sun glinted off their helmets. And then they lifted their bows. And these, exper these experienced archers used all their strength to, to draw back a drawback weight of 100 to 120 pounds. I mean, that is a strong upper muscle as you need for that. Now, you know, the archers may have come from the lower ranks of society, but they were ranked a lot higher than ordinary infantry. They were seen as skilled killers on a medieval battlefield. And in today's money, they would have earned up to about 120 pounds a day. The Cheshire archers drew back their bowstrings. And they let fly. Now, skilled English archers, it's renowned, could fire at least 12 arrows a minute, travelling at a terminal velocity of 200 miles an hour. Their effect, when used en masse, was devastating. A contemporary chronicler described the scene as, quote, The sun, which at that time was bright and clear, lost its brightness so thick for the arrows. Uh, and another chronicler, uh, Thomas uh, Walsingham, described how the king's men fell like leaves in the autumn. Now, you know, we know that there were at least 4,000 archers from Cheshire in the rebel ranks. So in that opening minute, just think about this, in that opening minute, the royalist vanguard could have been hit by something like 48,000 arrows travelling at 200 miles an hour. Can you imagine the carnage? In fact, uh, at, the, at the battlefield, in the, there's a great visitor centre, actually, as well as a very good farm shop and cafe. There's a, an exhibit and there's a photo there of this skull that's uh, recovered from the Battle of uh, Toton during the Wars of the Roses about 60 years later. But it just shows just how devastating an arrow could be when it hit human bone, in this case a skull. And the vanguard advanced into this. But eventually... As the Cheshire bowmen put, used up their supply of arrows from their belts, the vanguard were able to wake their way through the peas and close in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. But at that moment, their leader, Stafford, was killed. And that was the last straw. You know, they had been decimated with, you know, they'd gone through the hell of the, the missile attack of the, the arrows, 
in this hot day coming up through all that pea field, the leader had just been killed. The vanguard fled. It was now the moment for the rebels to drive home at their advantage. Hotspur ordered a general charge down the hill towards the centre of the royal army. Harry Hotspur had one aim, kill the king. Henry IV was wise to this and had actually dressed several knights in his own livery, so no one quite knew where the ki which one was the king. On the king's left flank, his son Henry, Prince of Wales, was actually struck in the left-hand side of his face next to his nose by an arrow that actually penetrated six inches. But he refused to leave the field. Later he'd be treated by a surgeon who successfully removed the arrowhead from the Prince Hal's face but left him with a very obvious scar for the rest of his life. Prince Hal, wounded but still on his horse, wheeled his men round and they attacked the flank of the rebels as they hit the king's men around the spot where the church now stands. That was probably where the heaviest fighting took place. And it was just as well that he attacked their flank because the rebels had managed to cut their way through to the king, king's standard. The king's standard bearer himself, a man called Sir William Blount, was killed by Archibald Douglas. Now he's an interesting character. He was one of the Scottish captives that the, prison, uh, that the Percys had been unable to ransom. And, and he was a warrior. He'd been captured in a war between the English and the Scots up on the border and he was bored. So he joined the rebellion. <laughs> the captive who now was on your side. Some say it was actually uh, Douglas who had killed the Earl of Stafford earlier in the battle. So it seems that St uh, Douglas was having a good day. The fighting was frenetic and in the fury it was hard to tell friend from ho. Uh, King Henry was unseated from his horse but he rose and he fought on. And it was at this stage in the battle, on this hot summer's day, the reports claim that Harry Hotspur lifted his visor off his helmet to get some fresh air. And at that very moment, an arrow struck him in his mouth. In the confusion and the melee of the sh a shout went up on the rebel side that King Henry was dead and the royal army wavered. And it was Henry's turn to take off his helmet and shout that he was very much alive. But where, he asked, was Harry Hotspur? And in the deafening silence, the rebels realised it was their leader who was dead. And they wavered and broke and fled. As ever with medieval battles, it's hard to ascertain accurate casualty figures. But estimates suggest that somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000 men died in those couple of hours before dusk on the 21st of July 1403 at Shrewsbury. Many were buried in a mass grave over which Henry ordered a chapel, later a church, to be built so that prayers could be said for the souls of both the rebels and royalists. Because after all, all the dead were Englishmen. And the church is still there to this day. You can visit it, although it only holds one service a year. It's not, it's not, it has regular services. It only holds one service a year. On the Sunday closest to the vigil of Mary, to the vigil of Mary Magdalene, the day of the battle. To prove that Harry Hotspur was indeed dead, the king ordered his body to be salted and then displayed on a spear in Shrewsbury, town centre. And afterwards, it was quartered and the limbs were displayed in Chester, Bristol, Newcastle and London, whilst his head was displayed in York. His uncle Thomas was captured, uh, he was beheaded and his head was displayed on London Bridge. Now, compared to the casualties in the later Wars of the Roses, the Battle of Shrewsbury, the, the casualties at the Battle of Shrewsbury are not that great. Well, that's assuming you weren't one of the 1,600 to 2,000 men who were killed there. Eh? And the Battle of Shrewsbury did not end Owen Glyndwr's rebellion in Wales. It did, however, put off a dynastic civil war between the rival descendants of Edward III for another 50 years, until Sir Roger Mortimer and Harry Hotspur's great nephew. Richard of York took on Henry's grandson, Henry VI, but that's for another story. The Battle of Shrewsbury was, however, the first battle on English soil between two massed armies of archers, and it left the future Henry V with a scar on his face for the rest of his life. Moreover, the devastation caused by the archers was seared into his mind, and he'd use those learnings to deadly effect when 12 years later, he faced the massed French knights at Agincourt. But I'll leave you with, with this thought. What if that arrow 
had hit Henry a couple of inches higher in his eye. Or maybe a few inches lower in his mouth, like Hotspur. What if Prince Hal had been killed here at Shrewsbury? No Henry V, no Agincourt, no Shakespeare play with the Band of Brothers speech. Potentially, no War of the Roses. We're always taught about the big events in history. But often, it is the smallest of inches that change history forever. Thanks for joining me, and if you enjoyed this, subscribe to my channel, or indeed pop over to thehistorychat.com and join my mailing list where you'll get weekly updates on the events that have happened in British history. In the meantime, take care. I look forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm.